fullness that he attained somewhere along the line. It doesn't always give us a clear indication where Cornelius attained it, or where it does with Abraham, of course. Or some of the others that met up, like Nathaniel. It says, when he saw Nathaniel, it says, Behold, an Israelite in whose heart there is no guile. Well, meaning what? No treachery, no deceit. He was ready to come to his Messiah. See, so we don't know where it, where it occurred, but we know that the process has to come through a faithfulness that comes clean of their past life into faithful relationship with God. So what God's declared righteous cannot be unrighteous. So salvation, final salvation, the, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul, like 1 Peter 1, 9, is dependent upon your deeds, good or evil. If that's adding to, or if that's trying to earn something or merit in your mind, well, you're going to have to get that out of your mind. Because Jesus said, he that endureth to the end shall be saved. See, because salvation, final salvation, is a hope in the age to come, yet to be reaped. It's not here yet. You don't have eternal life while you're walking around in this mortal coil. It's yet to come. So this conundrum that they say they don't believe in eternal security, but they can't make salvation dependent on deeds of righteousness. And then they, so what's that make them? Just like Romans chapter 1 says, so they hold or suppress the truth in unrighteousness and deny that it's possible. And that's exactly what they do. By denying these things, not taking this stuff into consideration, what real faith is, what a real salvation is about, just trust in or receive in Jesus and all that stuff. They're suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. And then they hold people in contempt and say, well, they're filthy and they're liars and all the rest of it. Just like the filthy rag. Well, all righteousness is filthy rag. Well, it came from Isaiah 64, which he's speaking to the sinful people that need to come to repentance. He's not pronouncing that the whole world that any attempt they make at righteousness is just filthy rags in God's sight. No, God says it's acceptable in his sight. In fact, those that had washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb in Revelation 7, 14 are seen again in Revelation 19, 8, where it says that their white robes that were washed in the blood of the, blood of the Lamb for their past sins remitted were the righteous acts of the saints. Let's check it out in Revelation 19, 8. The white linen, the clean white linen, is the righteous acts of the saints. What? The acts that they, in faithfulness, in purity, in holiness unto God. That's what. So you can't have your filthy rags in a magic cloak and present yourself to God. Well, you can say to me, well, if you want to present your own righteousness to God at the judgment, well, good luck. Well, I have to respond, well, if you want to present your filthy rags to him with this magic cloak that you think you have, I say good luck. Because it's not going to happen. Because you're beguiled by enticing words. That's what's happened here. Now let's look a little bit at this word imputed. The word imputed is logizomai in the scriptures, meaning to account or reckon or deem, thinks, uh, suppose, consider. It's, of course, translated imputed in a couple of places. But the word imputed is a legal term taken from the Latin, impute, uh, which, which does mean to attribute or ascribe something to a person as to impute them just when they remain unjust. Just like it says in the notes and all the commentaries, like a considerable sum of money is deposited into your account when you don't have any money, and now you, you're considered to be a you know, millionaire now. Well, that's not what, it, of course, the word legizomai means whatsoever. It has no, no shade of meaning of that. And, of course, the, the, the people that study language, languages know this. Although they still deceive you, they beguile you. See, beguile is the exact opposite of this peril of Gizemai. And it's used a couple of times in the scriptures, you know, let no one uh, deceive you or beguile you with enticing words in Colossians 2.4. And be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourself or beguiling yourself. By what? False reasoning. The false reasoning that you're clothed in his righteousness and he don't see your sin. That you've got a wicked heart, but you're pure in Christ. See, you're deceived or beguiled by a false reasoning or a false reckoning. So what he's talking about is it's in this, this word, legizomai, meaning in the Greek, to consider someone righteous. So Abraham's faith was considered to be righteousness. Because why? He was walking in the steps of faith and doing what was right. 
And that goes on to explain in Romans chapter 4, verses 12, on through to the end of the chapter. Not by sacrifices and offering and works, but faithfully in Christ. So God can justify the ungodly and accept their faith, that's faithfulness and obedience from their heart, as righteousness, because in Scripture, that's what faith is shown to be. That's the reason they'll never understand it in these churches, these this flesh kings in the church. Because they don't understand that a person could ever stop sinning. They don't understand what faith is. They don't understand the atonement. They don't, really don't understand anything about the scriptures. It's all backwards to them. So the scripture is righteousness is what you do and not what you receive. He who does what is right is righteous. Abel attained witness that his deeds were righteous. Hebrews 11.4 Anyone who does what is right is righteous. First John 2.29. See, John repeats it again and again and again in his, in his epistle, trying to drive home the point. So they have deceived you into thinking that this word legizomai, or imputed, has some special condemnation of meaning that its magic transfer takes place or exchange. But that's not the case at all. Now, in, in 2 Corinthians 5.21, this verse has been mutilated by the translators because they believed in this, this doctrine as we talked about Christ being made sin in our atonement lessons, in our Bible study. It says in the King James Version, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. See, the passage is mutilated for the purpose of supporting this notion that Christ becomes sin on the cross and then he transfers his righteousness to you when you believe in him, when you trust. So what they did was they added to the scriptures. If you look at that in just in the Greek, if you just pull it up on the lexicon in the Greek and click on the entire verse, you'll see that, that there's only paeo and harmatia, where it says he's made, made him to be sin. So it's, it's paeo and, and harmatia. It, does, it doesn't give any of these other prepositions. But they added, they added, hath made him to be. They added all that. And the same thing they did in the second part, that we might be made... That word in the Greek is just the word to become, which you become, not made to be, that you might become righteous. So a proper reading of that verse would be thus, but of him, it says, we, uh, for we have been he has been made a sin offering on our behalf, who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. See, become, in the subjunctive mode again, in that mode where it says something that may or may not occur depending on circumstances. So the context of verses 20 or 19, actually to 21, is talking about reconciliation in this chapter, 2 Corinthians 5, and then Paul beseeching, be ye reconciled to God because we're ambassadors of that reconciliation. So you're yet to be reconciled through repentance and faith. Yes, he reconciled the world to himself through Christ. Yes, he died while we were yet sinners. But you have yet to be reconciled until you come through repentance. So the term that we have, he has made us to be righteous, or you are made to be, is not scriptural. Just like, the, just like the, the, the other phrase in there, made him to be sin. Both were added to the text. And you can check this out yourself in the script. You don't have to be a linguist or an expert in the Greek to check this out. They supposedly state that, that so they can support, well, there it is in 2 Corinthians 5.21, he, he was made to be sin. No, a sin offering, as, as any sacrifice, as the shadows and types in the Old Testament would indicate, was all sin offerings. Like in Leviticus, you'll see in the Greek version of Leviticus, sin offering is used over 120 times in context of an offering that was a type and a shadow uh, to the final offering of Christ where he offered himself as a lamb without spot so that we could be cleansed and purged of our past sins once and for all, not to be repeated, not so you can go trample the blood and confess it all day long while you keep willfully sinning. No, no, a once and for all sacrifice so that he can take away sin. Unlike the blood of animals that could not take away even unintentional sins, and that's what they were offered for was unintentional sins, never intentional intentional willful sins were dead were dealt with by death like hebrews 10 26 through 31 says but he couldn't even take away those because they had to be repeated year after year as hebrews says even the day of atonement was for unintentional sins that were done in ignorance 
But Christ's sacrifice takes away sin once and for all for those that are purged and cleansed in this faithful repentance and coming to him. So there's no transferring taking place here. And in Scripture, then, it's always righteousness, then, as you would see in the notes if 